this is um, Love in the Garden of the Hesperides, or The Theft of a Newt. I awaken with the feeling a tide has receded, taking with it some necessary part of the self. My feet planted on shifting sand, the waters of forgetfulness have abandoned me naked on the shores of consciousness. The sea has never been so low, revealing a continent of despair. I search, I scan, and I retrieve a moment, a small victory once snatched from defeat's strong jaws. Rehearsing Shakespeare's love's labors lost for the voice coach of the Royal Shakespeare Company. I'm reciting Barone's long speech on love and exclaim, it adds a precious scene to the eye. A lover's ear will gaze, a lover's eyes will gaze an eagle blind. A lover's ear will hear the lowest sound when the suspicious head of theft is stopped. Love's feeling is more soft and sensible than are the tender horns of cuckled snails. Love's tongue proves dainty bock as gross in taste. And for valor, is not love a Hercules still climbing trees in the Hesperides? Well, with the audacity that only the young can and should have, I said to her something to the effect that the suspicious head of theft had no business to be amongst the eagle's gaze or the cuckled snails, let alone the dainty tongue of Bacchus. It felt arbitrary and wildly out of place. Well, of course, I kept silent my larger question, which was what in hell was Hercules doing up in the tree all that time anyway? Well, the patronizing dismissal that greeted this can only be imagined, but it was enough to light a fire under me. Undaunted, I plunged into research, which in those days meant libraries and books you could touch and smell. Though I can find nothing to substantiate it today, 30 years ago, I found in an obscure footnote somewhere uh, an early Arden edition or, or an out of print variorum, perhaps, that in the earliest folio, it was recorded as the suspicious head of the eft is stopped. The eft being a newt or a salamander in it, quote, its juvenile terrestrial stage. Well, there it was, the shaft of light I was searching for. Shakespeare is not saying a lover's ear is attuned to the human malfeasance of daily plunder and prey, but rather it is in concert with this dear little amphibious creature as it emerges from its puddle for a brief moment to listen to the music of the spheres. And as fate would have it, it would be made to retreat for centuries until it was whispered back into existence by one Edwardian scholar or another in a footnote at the bottom of a page. I could so clearly see that Shakespeare had given us a perfectly organic circular shape, bringing our attention from the soaring height of the eagle's eye down to the semi-aquatic home of the eft and the cuckled snails and leaving Bacchus's tug out of it for a moment, straight up again to the treetops where Hercules is doing God only knows what. I never reported this back to either the speech coach or the director because this was not an argument I wanted to win. It was enough for me to know, me and my dear little amphibious friend. It is the longest speech in Shakespeare and as grandiloquent as it comes. I slyly worked it in and counted on my F to perform its magic on cue, which it did brilliantly. And so this morning at 7.46 AM, I am thus restored to personhood. But what are the other parts I left out, I thought, at 7.52 a.m.? The part about this guy in the tree somewhere. Well, for better or for worse, we are no longer required to go to a physical library to look things up. A quick Google search tells us that, quote, the Garden of the Hesperides is Goddess Hera's orchard, where either a single apple tree or a grove grows, producing golden apples. And as she is known for her jealous rages, she has the orchard guarded by a hundred headed dragon named Laden. Hera, uh, Hercules rather, breaks into the garden, slays the dragon and steals the golden apples. But why is it that the very name of this garden, Hesperides, 
is so powerful that even pronouncing it is a potent experience. Suddenly, my eft reappears to me, unsummoned. In its hands, if it could be said to have hands, it produced a key and points to the gate enclosing the garden of the Hesperides. Open it, he says, it's where you live. This I remember, I am six. I am in a Catholic hospital in a ward specifically designated for children with respiratory disease. I can hear the officious sound of the nun's black shoes tapping on the linoleum floor in the corridor, almost as though they are signaling out messages to one another. They are sisters of mercy and they are dressed in the floor length white habit, which was the order of those pre-Vatican II days. They wear a stiff white wimple that protrudes from the side of their faces by about an inch and seems to restrict their peripheral vision. I'm fascinated by the way they move. Always it seems in clumps of two or three and with great purpose, but I am uncomfortable around them as they make me feel as though I've done something terribly wrong and they are sworn to a secrecy I don't understand. I am in a bed that is entirely covered by a large oxygen tent made of clear isinglass that continues down past the slats on the side of the bed and it crinkles when moved. Looking from within, everything is distorted into waves and each source of light takes on an odd halo. There is a young Indian man sitting on a chair beside the bed to my right. He is wearing a blue green V-neck top. He's a private nurse that my parents have hired. I can see him looking directly at me through the clear barrier, but unlike the nuns, there's a continuous stream of calmness and well-being that flows between us like warm beach sand running through outstretched fingers. I'm captivated by his eyes, which are a very light brown with flecks of gold and fringed with dark lashes. His hair is shiny and so black it seems to reflect blue. I don't know his name, so I'll call him Hercules. It's morning and I have finished the oatmeal on the tray in front of me. He unfastens the oxygen tent and removes the tray. And then he says to me, swing your legs around. I wanna show you something. As I do, he lifts me off the bed into the warmth of his strong brown arms and carries me down, the, down to the solarium at the end of the corridor. It is on the top floor of the old building and we are looking out just above the treetops. It's been snowing heavily all night and the large flakes are swirling down. Beneath it, uh, beneath us is a neighborhood of large old houses with steeply slanting roofs and turrets and bays, imposing chimneys and outbuildings with large weather vane cupolas. As he holds me there before the window, I become aware of his smell and to this day, I think of him whenever I'm around sandalwood soap. He slowly raises his arm and with his index finger, he points across the rooftops to where the snow has been piling up all night. And he asks, what do you see? Well, I know this game. I've played it often only with clouds in the sky. I see dragons, I say, looking down on the rooftops. White dragons in a line. They're holding hands. Why are they holding hands, he asks. Because they want to dance, I say, only they don't know how to. So they're listening to the music. Hercules says that he sees the same thing too. And when he smiles, there's peppermint on his breath.